You are watching special event coverage on usanow.tv. American Matters series begins with this event from Loudoun County, Virginia, recorded live on May 3rd, 2022. The Virginia 10th Congressional District Republican Candidates Forum, presented by Army of Parents in partnership with Moms for Liberty. Welcome to the American Matters event. My name is Alicia Brand, and I am president and co-founder of Army of Parents. My Thank you very much. My team is Aaron Poe. Please stand up. Carly Copeland. George Taplin. And then Paul Chen, he unfortunately had to go to work. And then we partnered today with a fabulous parent advocacy group named Moms for Liberty. And I'd like to introduce um, Cheryl Otterjane and Beth Hess, Debbie Doolittle. And it's been an incredible pleasure to work with, with this group of ladies and two gentlemen. And we are a group that has like interests. We believe in fighting for freedom and liberty and high standards of education, parental rights, and safety in our schools. But the other thing that we believe in is fighting for the American dream. And when I say American dream, I mean fighting for our children so that they can have the opportunity to achieve, not be given, the American dream. We believe in making sure that we put the right people in the right seats to make sure that we have an America of tomorrow for our children and for their children. So everyone that's in this room, please get a group of your friends to go and vote. We have five terrific candidates tonight. There are actually 11 all together, and they are all fabulous. You're going to have a very hard time deciding because they're so good. But it says a lot about the state of this country when 11 people get out from behind their keyboards and into the action to fight what our administration is doing to our country. So I'd like to introduce our first guest. His name is Luke Rosiak. Luke is a Daily Wire journalist. He is the one that broke the Scott Smith and his daughter rape story in Loudoun County Public Schools. He wrote a new book called Race to the Bottom. I was very honored because Luke gave me an early copy and he asked me if I would write a review. And I read the book and I did not expect to be as frightened as I was. And you will be frightened because you will not believe the dark money that is behind what's happening in our schools and behind our countries. So I recommend getting Luke's book. And without further ado, the author of Race to the Bottom, Luke Rosiak. Thank you so much, Alicia. It's great to be here. Um, so you guys know me as the Daily Wire investigative reporter that broke the Loudon rape story and uh, several of the other stories that shone the spotlight on schools in Northern Virginia, Fairfax, and Loudoun counties. Um, it's been incredible to watch what's happened in the last couple of years, the emergence of parents as America's newest and most important special interest group. Um, the, my newest crusade is breaking up Loudoun and Fairfax County. We're on a winning streak here. We can do this. The, the, the problem with the schools, the biggest reason Virginia schools went bad is because they're too big. Other places have small towns where the school board members and the superintendents are your neighbors. It's no big deal. It's not a giant bureaucracy that doesn't care about you and will betray you. We can break up Fairfax and Loudoun County and a Republican legislature in Richmond can do so by granting charters to towns so that they become cities. That's all you have to do. A city is not part of a county in, in Virginia. So we can do this. We, we're on a winning streak here. We did some amazing things with the schools, and it turns out when the GOP is party of parents, the GOP wins. 
But when we talk about small government as a conservatives, we're not just talking about low spending. We're also talking about geographically small government. That is the, at the root of the problems in Virginia is that. So I believe we can do this. Uh, we can elect and work on the Republicans in Richmond so that they start giving out these city charters to anyone who wants them. Western Loudoun wants to become a city. We draw the line in the middle of Loudoun and those crazy people that are protesting outside, they can have their county and we'll have another one. <laughs> so my career was mostly focused on, as a journalist, um, Washington politics and many people in, in politics and journalism we always thought that Washington was what mattered, that local stuff was boring and it didn't matter. In 2019, I realized everything I always thought I knew was wrong. I learned that in Fairfax County, out of the 10 Democrats on the school board, not a single school board member had children in the school system. They were all there for their own weird, creepy agendas that had nothing to do whatsoever with helping kids learn. And so I quit my job focusing on, on Washington stuff, and I spent a year investigating the schools uh, to write my book, Race to the Bottom. Um, and you know, basically, I, I realized that local politics are what impacts people more. You feel when you know, the, the prosecutor or the sheriff or the zoning and land use boards, the school boards, those are the things that impact your life. When you wake up in the morning, what your day-to-day -day life is like, Honestly, it matters more than a lot of what Washington is doing. And so um, I started following local politics, and I gained such respect for the people that have been doing this, like many people in this room, for years. Because there's no fame or glory in it, but you do it because it matters. Another thing I learned is precisely because very few people were paying attention to local politics, it created a vacuum which was filled by really bad special interests. Um, you know, that's part of what I document in my book is the incredible forces, billionaire foundations, charlatan consultants, the teachers unions, they've taken it all over because so few of us were paying attention. Um, and that's really how corruption happens, is when people aren't looking, that's where the bad guys go. Um, but you guys, to your credit, all of you have, in, your, in many of you have been involved for years and in your own way you've sacrificed. Um, there's one person in particular, uh, Larry O'Connor, who has been a godsend for those of us who care about local politics. Um, WMAL is conservative leaning, but even if you take politics out of it, they cover the substantive issues of school boards and similar issues in a, in a, in a fuller way than the other left-leaning stations. And the reason is because we all know that most people around here tend to vote for Democrats, but what we also know is that if they understood that the radicals that they accidentally elected in 5% turnout primaries, how radical those people were, many of our neighbors who have tended to vote Democrat wouldn't actually support it. Um, that's why I think you won't find much coverage of what school boards and county boards of supervisors and things like that do on the other stations. But day after day, Larry and his co-hosts get up early in the morning and they've been asking all the right questions and they've been doing it with tenacity. So we couldn't ask for a better host today. Uh, let me give a warm welcome to Larry O'Connor. That was very kind Thank of you. Despite. Thank you. That was exactly how I wrote it out for him. That was brilliant. Good evening, everybody. I was about to say good morning. It's just a habit. Uh, good evening. You guys look great. This room looks great. What a great day to be uh, an American. Wow. And, uh, and certainly what a great time to be a Republican in this country, in this commonwealth, and certainly in this district and county. Uh, thank you. The energy and the enthusiasm and the interest that you all bring to the table every single day, literally, is what this country needs and it's what our founders had in mind. So applaud yourselves for everything you've already done getting us to this point. Um, listen, I wanna echo some of the things that Luke said in terms of how great we are at WMAL. Uh, we really are. <laughs> Except Chris Plant, He's, <laughs> this guy's a serious problem. Uh, one thing that I've learned to embrace, it's funny, whenever you get into talk radio, and I've been here on WMAO in Washington for, uh, I'm in my 10th year. I know, I still feel like the new kid. And um, 
is when you get into the talk radio business, of course, the, the icon of talk radio is the late, great Rush Limbaugh, right? And, and, and just behind him is now, you know, uh, the great one, our neighbor, literally, Mark Levin. And of course, these, these are national talk show hosts, right? They have national shows and they talk about national topics. So you get a job like this and you're doing mornings on WMAO and it's huge. This is the epitome for so many people in our business. And people come up to you, that's great. When are you getting a national show? <laughs> because that's sort of the idea, right? Everybody thinks that's what you need to do. And, and there are some people in the business who yeah, they look at a local show as a stepping stone for a national show. When I realized that my local show is in Washington, D.C., it's like, who needs a national show. And I realized that since all those other hosts are focusing so much on these national issues, national topics, national candidates, national and even international crises, no one's focusing on what's going on here in our town. No one's focusing on what's going on in our county, in our states, in our neighborhoods, and certainly not in our schools. So it was several years ago, um, really it was your neighbors to the south, Fairfax County, God bless them, and their school board. I mean, let's count our blessings, right? I mean, it could be a lot worse. Um, when they started pushing their agenda there several years ago, was, and nobody was covering it, we went to the Washington Post to look at the articles about what had just happened in the Fairfax County School Board, and there was nothing. And, and as Luke points out, I think, I think part of it is by design. Honestly, they don't want you to know what's going on. That's how we got this far down this path. So when we made this decision, and really I'll say a commitment to cover these stories, we sort of took a leap of faith that if it mattered to me, if it mattered to our program director, if it mattered to our production team, if we saw that this was important and that it matters, then we're gonna take that leap of faith that it matters to you. And boy, were we right, thank God. And thank God you've been there, not just supporting us and responding to what we've been covering on your behalf, but also then taking that energy. You know, everybody can get upset listening to the radio and get angry about what's going on and then show up to a school board meeting. And when they ignore you, you can just stay angry or you can do something about it. And you're doing something about it. And I think all of these candidates hear you loud and clear. So, Thank you, thank you for, for being exactly, as I said, what our founders expected. You know, our, our founders did not want us to obsess every four years about who would be sitting in the White House. I mean, there wasn't even a White House when they made our Constitution, right? Uh, they didn't want us to be so obsessed as the national media is about who the president is. And for God's sake, they started talking about the 2024 election within a month after Biden was inaugurated. Well, that's probably because we're dying for the next presidential election, but... But really, I mean, that's, the national media understands that they get ratings talking about that, but our founders wanted you to care about who your state legislator was, who your state senator was, who your city councilman was, and, and now that we have government-run schools, certainly they want you to know more about what's going on with your local school board, and it is by design that this stuff is all done without your notice. So, well, they're on notice now, and thank God for that. By the way, I neglected to say, our uh, founders certainly wanted you to know what your local sheriff was doing too. I apologize. <laughs> You're a great sheriff, Sheriff Chapman. I also want to point out, and thank you so much for uh, all of the love that you give to our radio station, WMAL, but when, I'm, when I get off the air at 9 a.m., I have a second job as well. I'm the senior columnist and creative director at Town Hall Media. Town Hall is the website, uh, it's a company, but it's all, uh, the Town Hall website, of course, but they also own the ancillary websites that you go to all the time, Hot Air, Red State, PJ Media, Bearing Arms, I'm Forgetting One, and twitchy, and, and the reason that I really wanna point this out to you and let you know that that's what I do is because my boss is here. Jonathan, are you uh, <laughs> He lives around here too, and there, you can check that off. All right, good. <laughs> All right, we are ready to, are you guys ready to get going? This is ready, are you hyped? Yes. Uh, I think in the same vein that local media doesn't want to tell you what your school board and your county supervisors are doing, they also don't want you to let you know what your congressman is doing because, I mean, remember that great thing Jennifer Wexton did? <laughs> you know, we, we started doing all of this coverage of the school boards and we kept uh, having the parents on the shows and Ian Pryor, I see in the audience, Ian became a regular on our program. 
And we started featuring these stories and featuring Luke Rosiak's great coverage. And, and we, you know, when you have, talk into a radio station, you turn on your morning radio, you, you, you think you're going to hear a politician or a senator and a congressman and even a president. And we've got those, sure. But at any given time over the last year, you'd tune in and you'd hear your neighbor. You'd hear a mom. You'd hear a dad. You'd hear a really concerned parent who is tired of your schools being ripped away from your control. And lo and behold, our little local radio show suddenly is on the national spotlight. So all of that concern about being a national host sort of went out the window because now we've got Tucker Carlson stealing our guests. <laughs> but that's okay, we work well together. And, and it's become a really, really powerful, powerful, there's Jonathan. I mentioned John, I mentioned John Hall. This whole thing has been about town hall, Jonathan, I promise. <laughs> So, uh, so let's get underway, shall we? I'm very excited for this. This is uh, not gonna be a debate per se as much as a candidate's forum and what I told the candidates in the green room, this is gonna be sort of a conversation, not confrontation, but I'm hoping now less than three weeks away from the primary day that these candidates are not going to, uh, not only just going to address the issues that we bring up to the table and tell you where they stand on them, but also what separates them from their opponents because I think that's a critical part of your decision-making process as voters here. Um, this is not gonna be one of the, I hate the Chris Wallace, like, sir, 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 and I'm not gonna do that. I don't like that. I'm gonna throw out the topic. Sometimes it might not even be a question and it's really incumbent on them to engage with each other, answer the questions, and I'm gonna do my best to make sure that everybody gets a fair say. Nobody's hogging the mic because that's my job. And, uh, and I think at the end of the day, two hours from now, or maybe a little less than two hours, no, maybe a little more than two hours, by the end of the evening, you're all going to be much more informed, enlightened, and energized voters and citizens, and that's the whole point here. That's what our country is all about. So are you ready to meet the candidates that are here tonight? All right, let's start with Hung Kao. I'm gonna get down off the stage here. And Mike Clancy. Good to see you. And John Henley. <laughs> Janine Lawson. And Brandon Michon. Let's go. Let's go, Brandon. Ladies and gentlemen, these are to this evening's panelists, candidates for the Republican nomination for the 10th Congressional District in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Fantastic. Take a seat, gang and grab your waters, just in case, they're right behind you. We'll start with an open question about my hair. How's it look? Yeah. You look younger than your brother. Right, not bad. <laughs> so the candidates know what our topics are, but they don't know what our specific questions or directions that we're gonna take on these topics, just so you know. And also, they asked me to do this, so <laughs> anything can happen. <laughs> no, seriously, I'm gonna say some stuff. But we're going to start with immigration, certainly a, a hot topic nationally over there. And you are running for Congress, let's remember, and you will be faced with immigration policies questions. So uh, I want to start actually uh, with you, Hung Kao, if we could, and then we'll just uh, engage the conversation. But I want you to sort of, uh, in your mind, explain what the DREAM Act is, because the DREAM Act will come up when you're in Congress, and uh, the pros and cons of whether you are in favor of passing or not passing the DREAM Act. Oh, thank you so much for that uh, question. Again, as a uh as a legal immigrant to this country, uh, I, I know the honor it is to stand in line for seven years and wait for that, that ability to vote and to become an American. That's the most precious thing in the world, is to become an American. And you know, I don't want to talk about any uh, you know, amnesty or, or Dream Act or anything until we secure that border. You, know, you don't start bailing out water from a boat until you actually plug the holes first, right? You gotta plug that hole. You have to finish that wall, you have to secure the border, and even with the border, it's not just about the wall. We have 
we have artificial intelligence, we have drones, we have a lot of other ways. We have LIDAR to, to look for, for uh, illegal crossings. And it's not just about illegal immigrants going across. I mean, it's, it's a mat matter of national security as well. Besides the, uh, the humanitarian issue, it's, you know, it, in, uh, in the 90s, there was only about 0.1% that were coming across that were not from South America. Now it's like 15%. And they are uh, special interest aliens. That means people from China, from Russia, from Yemen, from, uh, uh, you know, from all parts of the world that are coming through there. And so we need to secure the border for, for the sake of our national security. So if I can just be clear, I'm going to ask for a quick follow-up and then everyone can engage. Because the question is specifically about the DREAM Act, uh, which applies to those who are here, brought here illegally when they were children. Where do you stand on that? Again, you can't embrace the American dream without embracing the American law. So, I mean, if you broke the, you know, it's like a fruit of a poison tree, right? I mean, it's, if you came here illegally, then you need to go back in line like the rest of us and, and stand in line uh, legally. Okay. Ms. Lawson, this is something you've had to take up as a supervisor in Prince William County in terms of how it impacts uh, your region. Uh, thank you for that question. I'm an unequivocal no to the DREAM Act. Um, and. Regarding illegal immigration, I can tell you from a fiscal side, the impact it has had in Prince William County and our school system, our public safety. 287G is a program that Prince William County had in place with ICE for several years, over a decade. And when the, Demo when the Democrats took control of our county board in 2020, the first thing they went after was 287G. 287G uh, was working in collaboration with ICE after an illegal alien had committed a crime, and often they were violent crimes, we would contact ICE. ICE would come in and get the uh, illegal from our adult detention center, and they would oftentimes deport them back to their home country where, frankly, they belong. And I, I <coughs> unfortunately lost that vote with my two other Republican colleagues in May of 2020, but I stand by my commitment to secure the border. We have to finish building that wall. I have a strong record on the Board of County Supervisors. I stood with ch our Chairman Corey Stewart in January of 2017 when President Trump took office and Corey Stewart and I together wanted to know where those illegals were in our community. And unfortunately, we didn't get the answers that we wanted, but you can count on me to be very tough on illegal immigration. They, it is affecting our community in all kinds of ways, and we've got to take control of it. I think, well, and I'll just chime in. Regarding illegal immigration, we obviously need to protect our border. I mean, that's a, that's a no-brainer. We have hundreds of thousands of people coming across on a, you know, almost daily basis. Now, we can build a wall. We can, in, you know, increase security along the, the, you know, along the border. But the real issue that we need to be talking about is that we have a very complex and convoluted immigration process. So we are a nation of immigrants. People used to come across on a boat at Ellis Island and they get to experience the American dream. So if we help you know, provide a more efficient immigration process, I truly believe, especially for the southern border, you are going to dramatically reduce the number of people who are coming across which will open up and allow us to target the people who are doing illegal activities, drugs, smuggling, you know, trafficking in general, because we are a nation of immigrants and people want to come here to experience the American dream. So we should you know, be finding a way to make that at least a little more uh, efficient. Yeah, I would say, General. Larry, that um, there's a bill that Sal Congresswoman Salazar has proposed as a new immigration approach. It starts off with securing the border. Priority number one, we can't address immigration until we secure the border. But then she goes on and lays out a 10-year plan for how you come into the country, how you earn, to Hung's point, how you earn your citizenship. So it's not, there's no, there, she's trying to address the amnesty issue. No amnesty, you have to earn your citizenship. So that, instead of the DREAM Act, we ought to be looking at that kind of legislation. We have to reform immigration. That bill is not going to work. We need a bill that takes care of the border but also provides a way to earn citizenship. I'm not for the DREAM Act. Uh, if you look at what Democrats have done, they have intentionally allowed hundreds of thousands of people to invade our border. You had Russia have 150,000 people with tanks. They invaded Ukraine. We called that inv uh, invasion, we called it a war. We have two, two, what, two million people that have come into our country illegally or at least crossed our border. I know Sheriff Chapman's had to deal with some of the, the refugee crisis and, and things as well without input from the American people. So 
our, our rights as Americans is to communicate through our representatives of who we will allow, who we will not allow, when we will allow. So, you know, back in the late 1980s, you know, Democrats uh, and Republicans tried to work together uh, on a uh, comprehensive bill. So when you hear comprehensive, it's bad for America. Uh, they did not secure the border. Uh, they, they, they gave amnesty to a, to a few million people. Well, now we have 11 million yeah. that are in, in our country illegally. Uh, we've got to end birthright citizenship. We've got to end chain migration, or at least limit chain migration to immediate family members, spouses, kids, not cousin of my cousin of my cousin. Uh, and we allow 1.2 million uh, immigrants a year to come into our country. We do that because that's what we want to do as American people, because we are a nation of immigrants. Let's see if we can mix this up a little bit, because uh, I assure you, it, should you be our next congressman from the 10th district, uh, with the current occupant of the White House, whoever that may be during your two years, uh, they're not going to secure the border. They, they are already told they, they've got a border situation exactly how they want it. Yeah. So Jennifer Wexton, when she runs against you, she's going to say that you're interested in deporting the little nine-year-old girl in fourth grade who goes to school with your, with your son or daughter. That's the campaign ad they're going to run. Yep. We saw the campaign ads that, uh, that, that uh, Ralph Northam ran against Ed Gillespie with a guy in a pickup truck chasing little minority children through a park as if they're going to try to kill them. This is who you're going to be running against. So first, let's just go down the line. What is your response when your Democrat opponent says that you're looking to deport and kill young children? Because that's how they frame the DREAM Act issue. <clears throat> and secondly, if you could quickly, what will you do to push back on this administration to make them secure the border? Well, well first, I've been very vocal on my support of children. <laughs> so I think people know that. Um, second, I think regarding what I would do, I mean, we need to secure the border. I'm, I, we have to have empathy for the situation we are in. We are going to be attacked for a lot of different things, but the reality of what we are dealing with is there are people here. It is part of the plan of the Democrats in this administration. Why, are there, why won't people accept voter ID? There's a reason, right? There is a reason for all this. We have to figure out a smart way of simplifying a process while securing our border. I will push back, it's being proactive versus reactive. That's the biggest thing. So, look, the, the left's tactics and creating fear are, are something none of us are new to. And they're despicable in their ads, and Larry, you're absolutely right. They're gonna throw absolutely everything at whoever our nominee is. And we need somebody that is battle-tested and very thick-skinned because they're gonna fight tooth and nail to keep this seat. And I can tell you, uh, as, a, as a county supervisor who has faced the problems of illegal immigrants in her community, uh, we've got to stay tough on this issue. I look forward to one of the first votes taking when the Republicans take control of the House is finishing the job that President Trump started, which is securing the border. And, yeah. All right. And, 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 I, and I would also finish my remarks with, when the Republicans are in control of the House and Senate, which I believe we will be in November, it'll be time for President Biden to come meet with us. We're not gonna meet where he is. He needs to come where we are, and that includes the moderate Republicans. They need to come to where the conservatives are, and then we'll have a discussion. Well, on that, uh, I don't know if you've been paying attention over the last year and a half, but the Hispanic community is actually coming to the Republican side because we have more in common with them than, 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 than what we don't. I mean, families, education, uh, you know, justice, security, uh, job security. And I think, you know, let the Democrats be Democrats. We know what their tactics are going to be. But I think as Republicans, I think we can rise above their hate and show what exactly is happening, uh, you know, within these new American communities, uh, whether it be Hispanic, whether it be the Muslim community, to kind of bring people back. Now, as a member of Congress, what would I do? Uh, that's the nice thing about uh, Article 1, Section 8. I have the power of the purse. That means you, you fence funding until certain behaviors are adhered to. That's exactly what the Department of Education does with, with Title IX funding, and we should be able to do that with DHS funding, and that's what I would do. Yeah. Okay. So. 
Mike. So what the Democrats are missing out here is that the border, it's not just, it's not only the people coming across the border, but it's the drug trafficking and it's the human trafficking crisis. And those are humanitarian crises that have been created by the Biden administration. And what Congress has to do, and hopefully this Republican Congress will do, is reclaim its rightful role under the United States Constitution. The U.S. Congress is the is the body that makes the law. The president is supposed to execute those laws. And right now, Biden has issued almost 90 executive orders. He's legislating like a tyrant. And, that, and the Democratic Congress is letting him get away with it. The Republican Congress has to take back control of the legislative process. They have to start passing legislation to rescind his executive orders that have opened up the border. And we have to be bold, and we have to be courageous, and we can't back down. Right. I mean, all these points are correct. I mean, you, you have, it's a matter of human, uh, human, it's a humanitarian issue, right? Mothers or babies are being ripped away from mothers so that traffickers can use them as shields to go across the border. And the people that are most mad about this is the, the Latino community, the ones that came here legally. And this is, again, sending someone to Congress is a tactical thing. You have to find the right person with the right voice and the right agenda. And Again, let's, let's take that playbook, that Democratic playbook that says, keeps calling us racist, whatever, throw it back in their face. I came here legally. I know what it's like to, to have to stand in line. I know what it's like to wait honorably and do this the right way. And that's where she can't hold that against me. I'm like, hey, I can do it. Why can't everybody else do it? <laughs> All right. All right, we're clicking along here. Let's move on to foreign policy. There's been a lot of uh, discussion, you may have noticed, about, uh, well, Eastern Europe over the last couple of months. And in a way, we're sort of losing sight of the real problem over on the Pacific Rim with the nation of China. Let's talk about a couple of aspects there. We'll start with inter intellectual property. I'm paid to speak for a living. <clears throat> intellectual property. Uh, China is stealing our property. They've been doing it for decades. We've heard presidents since Clinton saying they're going to do something about it, and they haven't. Congress can do something about it. What sanctions would you recommend to be imposed on China for stealing U.S. intellectual property? And also, will you hold U.S. businesses accountable if they're aiding in this theft and they don't report it? Let's, uh, let's start with Mike. Yeah, this is... This is uh, we're fighting a global war here in the technology front. The U.S. is the number one technology powerhouse in the world. And China is trying to steal that from us. They steal our technology, they bring it to their companies, they replicate it, and then they compete with our businesses. This is a critical issue for our national security and, for our, and to maintain our te te technological uh, power position in the world. And so yes, we have to be aggressive with China. We have to impose sanctions on China if they're going to, uh, on the intellectual property front. We have to hold U.S. businesses accountable if they're aiding and abetting this technology. What China is doing is they're sending their students into their universities. And when they do that, they stay, they get educated, they get into American companies, and then they leave and they take the technology back. It's all part of a revolving door cycle where they're stealing our technology over and over again. So we have to hold the, you know, we have to be more aggressive at the university level with, with these students. We have to be more aggressive with the U.S. companies that are involved. And we have to be involved, be prepared to put sanctions in place to address China's intentional theft of our intellectual property. Yeah. Janine Lawson, do you differ on that issue? No, I, I agree with um, Mike, and I think that we need to be as tough on China as President Trump was. He made it very clear he was not going to mess around with them. And um, if that includes sanctions, absolutely. We, you know, it, it's, it's real. It's happening. We know it is. And um, I, I, find, I have found, as a county supervisor, some really strange situations where um, the, the Chinese are buying large parcels of land in Prince William County, mm -hmm. in my district. And uh, it, it raises my eyebrow, and I think they're being very methodical in this, and we have to absolutely be on the watch out and be serious about this. So re with regard to foreign policy right now, I truly think the wars we are going to be fighting going forward are going to be natural resources and mineral wars. Intellectual property is a piece of that equation, but now, we, are, we have the ability with technology, which we've been blessed with technology, that we can eliminate people from you know, a, a room in an office building. But the wars today are going to be fought 
over natural resources, land. Smithfield Foods is owned by a Chinese company, one of the largest pork producers in the United States. If you want to look at the Ukraine-Russia crisis right now, yes, it's a humanitarian crisis, but what is going to come out of that? China owns 2% of the world's uranium. Russia, 40%. When they default on their debt, which will happen under these sanctions, who is going to come and bail them out? China is. This is a natural resources war. It is, if we want to go EV technology tomorrow, where is it all coming from? Outside the United States. We must protect what we have domestically, and I'm not trying to get away from foreign policy because what we have today is we have world leaders who are playing a very, very complex game of chess, and our administration is playing a child's game. We need strong leaders who understand the complexities in a world where foreign policy is not just business, but also on the mineral and natural resource side. Hung Kao, do you want to jump in here as well? Yes, absolutely. So uh, like Mike said, there's 300,000 students from China in the United States. If just 0.1% of those were spies, that means you have 300 spies over here. And it's not just about uh, graduating doing, uh, and, and going to business. The, a lot of times in the defense industry, when we, when we um, or in the United States uh, Department of Defense, to come up with new technology, we put it out to the universities, Johns Hopkins University, um, you know, Harvard or MIT. And even though the professors may have security clearances, those graduate students don't. And they're taking that technology and sending it right back through the internet, right? And so we can get something to 80% and all they have to do is send it home and they, they make that difference, that 80% uh, difference. And that's a, you know, we need to hold the universities accountable. Yeah. You're not following the, the security gu guidelines for vetting those students. We need to take care of that right away. On intellectual property, if you could just chime in on that aspect of it. So Absolutely, I mean, it's question. intellectual, you know, there's patents for a reason, there's intellectual, we have to hold China accountable. When they do like 5G, for example, they're, they're, the way they negotiate it, they put in minus 50%, and they're pulling all sorts of data. Also, 23andMe, who here does 23andMe? Because all that data is going back to China. Technology. If I was to make a, <laughs> if I was to bioengineer a weapon, say COVID, right? What would I do? I'd look for the French fry genes because Americans love French fries or whatever, you know. And, and that's what that's what they're doing with, with all that data. That's a great screenplay idea, by the way. But I'm, <laughs> yeah. I will be following up on the COVID nineteen question in a moment, just to give you a heads up. Go ahead, yeah, Mr. Larry. You know, uh, you know, just over the past couple of months, uh, the Democrats, with Wexton support, voted for the American Competes Act. I call it the American Concedes Act because it gives away some of that intellectual property. So some of those things that we need to do from a congressional perspective to protect it, it's not in that bill. Maybe that's something to do with Eric Swalwell, I don't know. But at the end of the day, uh, we need to make that sure- That was part of the 0.01%. Yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, but we need to make sure that tech companies or whatever is offshore into China, that whatever that intellectual property is, that there is no agreement between an American company and a foreign power that they get any bit or piece of that intellectual property. That hurts us as Americans to be able to compete globally. That hurts all the way down to small business because it also adversely affects our GDP uh, and everything we do from the national, uh, national security standpoint. So from a sanctions, uh, st a sanctions standpoint, uh, I would go back, uh, you know, do some of the stuff that President Trump did, uh, look at steel, and then, then graduate over until they stop stealing our stuff because they're tunneling in through cyber, stealing a lot of that through companies. Uh, you know, one quick story, uh, you know, 2014, I went to the Eisenhower School of National Security and Resource Policy. We were up in New York uh, at Goldman Sachs, and it was neat because what they work with, they work with the FBI and counterintelligence officials, and they actually have what's called, and I can say this, they actually have what's called a false front. So that's where China and other entities try to tunnel in, tunnel in, and they think that they have something. Uh, and, and then our, our counterintelligence folks follow that all the way back. We need more defensive mechanisms like that on our national security and with our companies. That's how you're going to protect this country. Can I, can I, add, sure. can I add one more thing? I know that tonight's discussion is, is not going to center around education, but I can't help. Oh, it might venture. <laughs> <laughs> but I, but go I, ahead. I, I, thanks. I can't help but bring this up because China is eating our lunch when it comes to education. Mm -hmm. They're graduating more engineers than we're graduating students. That, can, that cannot happen any longer. Uh, we're concerned, well, not us in the room, but the radical left and the NEA 
they are far more concerned about, you know, a, a woke uh, agenda and making students feel inclusive and better. And, and I can't believe that we're at a, a day and time where we are eliminating advanced placement programs, advanced, advanced placement classes to make everybody feel, quote, included. China is salivating over that. We've got to get serious about our education and competing with China and other, country, other countries on a world stage. Yeah, I, I assure you in Beijing, there's no big debate over preferred pronouns. In right, right. Yeah. exactly. Yep. And we will get into those. Really fast on China, since the specter of COVID-19 has been raised, we've had the deaths of hundreds of thousands of Americans. We've had our economy crippled. We've had businesses lost. We've had children's lives ruined, as we well know, because of the effects of COVID-19. And yet to this day, Congress under Nancy Pelosi has not begun one congressional investigation into the origins of the virus and the role of the Chinese government in it. So let's start with Brandon and come all the way down the line here. If you go to Congress, this is something Jennifer Weston hasn't bothered herself with. Will this be an important issue for you to raise and move forward for congressional investigations into the origins of COVID-19? Yeah, I think we should understand where it's coming from. It's, it's obviously didn't appear from a bat that somebody ate. Um, with regards to investigations, and you want to talk about education for a minute, what I think, and let's talk about Loudoun County, being in education in the news for a while, what I told, said, and I said this on the news the other day, I will launch an investigation into the special interest groups, into the unions, into the DOJ, and into this administration for targeting parents over covid for what they did to our children for not letting them be in school. That's what we need to be investigating. We also can invest. I promise you the next subject will be. But we can investigate COVID and on the COVID side, what happened to our agency? What happened to our ability to choose whether you want to get the shot or don't want to get the shot or you want to wear a mask or don't wear a mask? Don't tell me what do I want to do. Let me make my own choices with my own free agency, and you look out for yourselves. Great. Let's just move down the line on, on the question of investment. Yeah. So uh, one thing I've learned is governing is a lot more fun when you're the party in power. For the first five years I was on the board, we were the party in power. It, it's not fun being the minority party. When we take back control of Congress, we, we have so many investigations to launch. Absolutely, one of them will be on where this virus, we know, we know it came from China. We, want it, we need to know exactly how calculated it was and how long they were planning and who they may have, may have been planning here in America with. Uh, they owe the, the explanation just, not just to the United States, but to the world. And we absolutely have to get to the bottom of that lab. Uh, can I also say that uh, President Biden, do, well, I know it's tough to say that, I agree, I agree. But, but do you all remember when he was, he was on the phone, he didn't, even, he didn't even ask the leader of China about the virus and its origin. Do you remember that? Yep, yep. Unbelievable. So absolutely, you can count on me to get to the bottom of that investigation. They probably found out on Hunter's laptop. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's probably what it was. Uh, but yeah, it's no, the I'm, least of the things they yeah, found on there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, absolutely. <laughs> there has to be a congressional investigation because look how many you know of our elderly this took. And you look at the southern border of where all the drugs are coming from across that border now that are killing our youth. So it's us in the middle who have to stand up for the rest of them now. So that includes investigation into the NIH, the CDC, and any politician who took money from China during that time needs to be fully investigated and held accountable. Does that include any high-ranking, well-paid employees of the CDC? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, I want to be sure. I'm... Absolutely. All right, John, ahead, yeah, John stole my thunder. So yes, we have to. We, we need to understand the origins of, of of COVID so that we can actually plan for the future and understand where we're going in terms of this disease and in terms of treating the disease and in terms of how we manage vaccinations. We do need to investigate Fauci and CDC and NIH and and, and how they may have been interrelated with that. 
uh, gain of function research that was being paid for by NIH to China mm -hmm. and how that played a role. That needs to be fully investigated. All of that needs to be disclosed. One, we can better secure our country, but also we can plan for the future and how to handle these types of diseases, these viruses, because this isn't going to be the, first, the, the last time we confront something like this. First thing I'm going to do is uh, declassify some of the top secret uh, documents that uh, I've run across. And, and that will open the eyes of the American people. But we, we also need, to, we know where it came from, right? It came from Wuhan. It's not like Canada or something like that. It's, it's in China. So that's where it came from. Second thing is I want to know, I want to hold Anthony Fauci accountable for death, right? Because look, look in Africa. They, there's very few deaths in Africa. Why? Because they use hydroxychloroquine as a prophylaxis for malaria. Look at India. The largest state in India, which is two-thirds of the size of the United States, they eradicated COVID with ivermectin. Their strike teams, their, their quick response teams use that as a prophylaxis all the time. Why are we using it? Why are we using rendesivir? Rendesivir is a poison. I mean, it's, they call it run death is near, right? Because you take that, you're going to die. Why are we not? I mean, there's money in that. There's a lot of money in the, that, that, um, in, in the drugs when, when it's a, instead of off-label. So we need to hold people accountable. For, uh, for killing our, our, our people. All right, we're gonna, please go ahead. <laughs> Told you I was gonna go off topic now and again. <laughs> Moving into the federal government, uh, you are running for House of Representatives. You'll be representing the 10th Congressional District on their behalf in that seat, one of 435 in the federal government. Uh, there will be some moments where you will have to affect education policy in your role as a congressman, not nearly as intimately as a school board member, but still, you will be leading the way on many issues. One issue you will for sure have to deal with has to do with the Biden administration unilaterally re rewriting Title IX. Mm -hmm. Title IX, of course, passed in 72 to protect equal access to academics and sports for women. They are on the verge of rewriting the law specifically to change out the name, the word sex and make it gender. Mm -hmm. And this will be from the federal level and a watershed event. Uh, let's start here now. Uh, your role as a congressman, congressperson, in uh, discussing this, debating it, and voting on it, and how you will push back against it, because the administration is going to act like they can do this unilaterally. So uh, let's go ahead and start, uh, sure, uh, with, uh, with Mr. Henley. Thank you. All right. Uh, the biggest issue with Title IX is if you look at the language of when it was passed, it, it was specifically there to design, you know, to protect women. Most of the time uh, in the 60s, a majority of men were graduating from university, 75, 80 percent. So they wanted to level the playing field. But where Congress made a mistake is the first sentence. We will leave this, leave this up to the executive to execute in accordance with rules, regulations, et cetera, et cetera. So what's that done? Depending on the presidential administration that's come in, it's either been to the left or it's been to the right. And that actually adversely affects uh, you know, women in sports. Uh, you, know, you look at you know, the, some of the transgender issues of, of men competing in women's sports and the administration trying to rewrite that rule based on sec, uh, gender identity, which pretty much is, to me, is, is, is anti-women. It goes against what it was there, what it was designed to do. So as a member of Congress, we need to look at that, uh, that act, and we need to actually put bookends. We will say, not, not based on sex, based on biological sex. Let, let's, let's be specific in whatever legislation we put in so that we don't have an imperial presidency who thinks they can do whatever they want through the Department of Education and use it as bludgeon hammer uh, uh, to affect K through, you know, K through 12 school or our universities. Well, it's crazy. It's crazy that Congress back in 1972 thought that women didn't need to be defined separately yeah. by definition. That's how yeah. outrageous this is. You know, XXXY, it's sort of biology, follow the science. Yep. So it's, it's sad that they have to actually go back in now and, and we are going to have to define this out so that uh, women, true, women really are protected in, yep. under Title IX and that they are protected in sports. You even have people like Michael Phelps saying something needs to change here because this is not fair. It's not equal sports. You know, they, you see it in track and field. We've seen it in swimming. It's not equal rights. It's not equal protection of the law under the 14th Amendment and the, and the Fifth Amendment. So w Congress is going to, whatever the Dems try to do now, the Republican Congress is going to have to go in and take control and reestablish a basic order to our society based on 
science. Yep. So, we go, go ahead and jump in. Yeah. Yeah. So, I was a Division One athlete, and um, blessed with the ability to throw a baseball. Took me only as far as college, but it was a great opportunity. I had to deal, and I saw my colleagues within the sports program on the on the women's side who had you know who fought to get the same opportunities as we did on the men's side. The definition of a woman is XX. The definition of a man is XY. There is no lineman that is a female on Alabama's football team. <laughs> There's not. There's a genetic difference, but we have spent so many years fighting as athletes, both men and women, to be appreciated and respected on the same stage. We cannot let it be defiled by people who want to take advantage of this woke and social agenda that is being crammed down our children's throats. Could we let right. the XX in here, or uh, <laughs> <laughs> you want to have the last? Well, I'd like Hung to go, because as a lady, I'd like to end this discussion. All right. <laughs> <laughs> You assume. XX or XY. <laughs> well, I guess you can, I mean, you can, you can identify as anything nowadays, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. Read the room, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Darn it. I thought this was a Democratic rally or something. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no. Ladies and gentlemen, look, the problem with Title IX also is he's, you know, by redefining it, you're, you're, you basically set women's rights back 250 years or mm -hmm. beyond. And, and also the language for, for gender fluidity, what it's doing is compelling speech. It's, it's violating our right to speech, right? So you have to call people by certain pronouns. That's, that's illegal. You can't force me. I mean, for Sheriff Chapman, for example, imagine one of his deputies going in and they, they're looking for a victim. They're like, they're over there. So they're looking for many, many victims, but it's only one person. Like, they, who, who's they? Like, is there? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is, Point. You know what I mean? Like it's, it, it confuses language. I mean, as a, 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 a person who speaks three languages, gosh, you know, the, the English language is already difficult enough as it is. <laughs> and uh, you come in there, you have no idea if you're talking about one day or many day. But, but it is a problem. It, it, it is, they, they're compelling your speech and they're, they're violating our First Amendment rights for freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Go ahead, so, have the last word. Now the accent. Now, now the accent. <laughs> And for the record, I still believe in chivalry, ladies first, but... <laughs> uh, so, fellas, I, I really like you, and I appreciate you standing up for my gender, but no offense, you cannot be the nightmare to Joe Biden that I plan to be on this issue. <laughs> uh, look, I, I have a record of standing up to the woke crowd on issues, whether it's June Pride Month, because it's LGBTQ plus more, and they can't even give me answers when I ask, what does plus more mean? And I vote no every June. I, vote, I voted no on the Virginia Equality Act where they want to incorporate gender identity into the Virginia values. I voted no. So I am rock solid on this. I cannot imagine in my wildest dream what the young ladies today, whether we're talking about a second grade little girl on a soccer team or an Olympic athlete, a, a, a college athlete of any division. How about a woman who is seeking shelter at a domestic violence shelter? This, this is an issue that affects far beyond Title IX. And it has to be stopped, and I will be as bold on this issue as I have been as a county supervisor. Ladies, you can count on me to defend our gender. Not on my watch will I allow the left to ruin who we are. They want to erase women now. That's how radical they've yeah. become. I will not stand for that. That is one of the reasons I got in this race. Jennifer Wexton voted for H.R. 5 which would have incorporated gender identity and sexual orientation into the 1964 Civil Rights Act. That would wreak havoc on our country legally, on our churches, 
everything. That is one of the key votes that she took last year when I got in this race long before anybody else on this stage, long before this district looked at, like it was a district that we could actually flip. That is a key issue for me. You can count on me. I will be Joe Biden's worst nightmare on this issue. All right. Well, I mean, hold on. I, I don't think you need to be a woman to, to, to defend women's rights. I mean, I have three daughters, and I will die for those young ladies. I agree. People. I agree. Well, and let's, let's get into the nitty gritty, because much of our discussion there at Title IX focused on, on collegiate sports and collegiate athletics, and that's a big part of it. But we saw how Title IX was used and abused right here in Loudoun County in the school system. Yep. We're talking about the, the safety and privacy of that, that sanctum sanctorum of a girl's restroom at a school. Uh, that, that can now be a place of danger for a young girl. And Jennifer Weston had nothing to say about this issue on behalf of her constituents. So as a congressman, as a congresswoman, what is your role or how would you utilize your voice when issues like this continue to happen in your district? Go ahead, on down the I line. Mean, th thank you. Uh, Go ahead. Yes, a lot of things happen at the local level, but as your congressman, I will be out there. I will use my... my um, Influence, and I'll be right there next to Sheriff Chapman. I'll be right there next to, to uh, once we, we get in a, a Republican school board, I'll be right next to each one and every one of them. Well, I think, right, the first thing I would do as a congressman elected in 22 is help elect a Republican school board in 23. Loudoun County, Prince William County, Fairfax County, absolutely. And it's the greatest thing that's happening right now is that we have a Republican Attorney General who is investigating this, yep. and he's launched a grand jury investigation, which means he's looking at criminal charges for what happened in Loudoun County, and rightfully so. Yep. Yeah, and, yeah, I'm, I'm a big proponent of the 10th Amendment for states' rights, but as if, uh, the, the benefit we have as candidates, or if one of us is elected, is that we're 36 miles outside Washington, D.C., which means you don't have to live in this swamp longer than what you need to. <laughs> and it is a swamp, believe me. I've worked with people for five years on their, uh, in, in my previous life and this current one. And, and what we need to do as congressional representatives is represent, show up in these districts, all the way from Rappahannock to Fauquier, uh, you know, Fairfax, Prince William, Loudoun County. Be in the district. Wexton is not. And I'll let you in on a little secret. I was in a, a telecon uh, last night or a Zoom uh, where I was being, ter ter not interrogated, I was being talked to by the NAACP, and we Wexton just pops up right there, and she gives her, you know, three, four, five, eight-minute speech, and they kept calling her Wexler, Wexler, Wexler. <laughs> Guess what? They're going to know who Henley is, because Henley's going to be right there talking to everybody, Republicans, Democrats, uh, and it doesn't, doesn't matter. Anybody who's willing to listen to Republican ideas and conservative values, I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to be in the district. I'm going to be visible. Where is Wexton, right? <laughs> I mean, seriously, she's, she's nowhere. She's been completely MIA, and all the uh, craziness that is going on here in Loudoun County with the school, the superintendent, the woke school board. She's buddies with Buddha Bibaraj. She, of course, doesn't want to call out the George Soros-funded prosecutor that, that is here in Loudoun County. She's certainly not serving her constituents. She's still hiding behind a laptop. Her, her staff is not physically present. She casts votes by proxy. Where is Wexton? She is MIA. I can tell you as a county supervisor, I hold town halls. My door is always open to people that agree with me and disagree with me. Right now, I am in the biggest land use battle in Prince William County for decades. The Democrats that I serve with think it's a grand idea to rezone a bunch of land next to the Manassas National Battlefield. That's a national park that we are blessed to have in Prince William County. It is, a, it is where the Jeez, first point. major conflict of the Civil War started. That's Before I launched this race, I asked Jennifer Wexton in a formal letter as the Close county line. supervisor to the congresswoman who represents the park Please come out and help me defend the park's interest and defend the rural area and our watershed. Silence for months. In January, the same week that the Democrat Congressional Campaign Committee 
acknowledged, conceded that this seat is vulnerable is the first time Jennifer Wexton decided to open her mouth about this park. Trust me, folks, I have a different approach to governing. I, I know as a county supervisor that I, I govern close to the people. I will take that same tenacity and always be out in the district talking to people, whether you agree with me or disagree with me. So, I'm glad. Um, so 2020 exposed the biggest fallacy at the local, state, and federal government. It's one key word, leadership. Leadership is hard. Leadership is showing up when others don't. I'm the only candidate in this race who showed up to a Loudoun County School Board meeting before they announced they're running for Congress. There are hundreds of you out here today who fought for our children for opening schools, being targeted, being told that we have to mask them, and everything else that's happening locally. I'm also the only candidate that showed up to defend our Sheriff Chapman as he was being canceled by the Loudoun County Board of Supervisors. Everyone else went to another GOP event to try to chase a few votes. Showing up is not easy. I will continue to show up for you. I will do it when it's not easy. I'm the only one in this race, and because of what you guys did to show up this last year is the reason why we now have a Republican governor in Richmond. You're right. If I can, if leadership, I can on that leadership is really hard. You're absolutely right. Leadership is difficult. Leading men and women to battle, going to certain death, that is really difficult. And not only that, it's, it's more than just showing up and screaming at people. It's, it's about getting, getting things done, rolling up your sleeves. You know, we left so many thousands of people behind in Afghanistan, including our own American citizens. Since September, my team and I have gotten out 162 people, men, women, and children, at night. That's what leadership is. It's not about getting in front of people and yelling at them. It's about rolling up your sleeves and getting it done. And right now, we're working with a certain fruit company to bring in old um, iPhones to refurbish it and send it out to, to Ukraine. Like, they don't want uh, attribution. Right. But that's what we do. That's what leaders do. We don't just stand up there and, and grandstand. We actually get crap done. <laughs> I don't want to get in the way of anyone and mixing that, it up. We're, can I do that real if, quick? If, if, as long as you address the, the issue at hand. You know. <laughs> what was the issue again? Uh, <laughs> it, oh, no, I, I already answered You already answered it. Already answered. I, was, I, was gonna... Let, I and assure you I have more questions with regard to education and specifically federal funding for education coming up a little later. Well, um, actually, I, I'd like to address Brandon. Brandon. Yeah, yeah. Brand, Brandon did sort of call you all out. So go yeah. ahead. And I told you you could respond. Yeah. <laughs> There's no names. There's I, no I names. said they could respond if you called him up by name, so he cleverly didn't name anyone. So, Brandon, I certainly appreciate what you've done as a parent in Prince William County. And I did know you, you know, when you um, went viral, and good for you. I applaud you for that. But to be fair, I don't want you also to be up here spreading fake news, which is what you just did. I was actually at the Loudoun County School Board meetings last spring and summer before I launched in the parking lot with rallies. I, you may have been there too, but I was certainly there, so don't accuse me of not being in Loudoun County before I launched. And secondly, I would absolutely have been at Sheriff Chapman's at the Board of County Supervisors meeting a few weeks ago when Phyllis Randall and the Democrats tried to, uh, in another attempt, diminish his department and create a, a, a police department. I, sir, was serving on the Prince William County Board that night. Well, you just, you just said I, I, you just spoke as if I had gone to a GOP meeting. No, I was doing my job to the people of Prince William County, which I was elected to do. So get your facts straight. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, and, and, and on that as well. Uh, All right. If you, you want to talk about facts, we can pull out some facts. Yeah. We we tried. You know, I, we'll you know I, I talk with a lot of parents and stuff, and you know, tried to actually address the uh, you know the school board. Uh, but I got an email, uh, you do not have an address in here, so no, you can't. I said, but I'm a federal candidate, and if elected, I plan on still continuing the advocacy to bring kind of unity into what you guys kind of have screwed up. Uh, and they said, well, if you're a candidate, then we'll let you speak. Until then, uh, we can't let you in. And I've got that in email. So there's, there's a couple people here who have that email as well that I share with. Uh, but, you know, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll echo Janine's, you know, thanks for standing up, you know, because... Uh, you know, because you did stand up and you did say something, you know, you, you did bring, uh, highlighted some of the parents, like Army of Parents and, and a lot of parents in here. Yeah, they're we'll great. We we'll also have voices uh, in there. So as we march forward, we're going to do this together. 
uh, and, and we're going to bring a victory uh, come, uh, uh, come, come November. That's yeah, I, I neglected to say, and I should have, I was saving it to the end, but all of the candidates, maybe I should have said it at first, all of the candidates before the debate uh, have, or our discussions this evening have all just said that they will absolutely support the winner of this nomination. Absolutely. Jennifer Wexton is the real problem here. Absolutely. And Republican control of the House is what's at stake. And we're all on the same page there. Absolutely. All right, can we, let's, unless, we're good? We're good. All right, let's move on to the economy. We've got more on, on schools. We've got more on federal funding for schools and other programs there, but I want to move on to the economy. COVID-19 enabled Congress to pass a whole lot of stimulus bills. They were all designed to help the economy. Boy, really doing a great job, isn't it? I want you to talk about the effect of these stimulus bills from your opinion about how it actually did, those stimulus bills did affect the economy and our future financial health. And uh, what will you propose when you get into Congress to minimize the negative consequences that we are dealing with? I believe we're uh, down to Ms. Lawson now for it to start things off. Thank you. Uh, wow, I, this is a great question for me. It is disgusting the amount of money that has been thrown at the localities all under the, quote, COVID relief. And honestly, some of the Republicans are to blame for this as well. Prince, mm -hmm. Prince William County has received just, just ARPA funding, which was under the Biden administration, which was a party line vote. Just Prince William County alone, $90 million. We got, you know, the, the CARES Act funding, which was 70, I think it was 75 million in 2020, if I recall correctly. We shared some of that with our schools, but the ARPA funding, the school division gets their own big tranche of money. Just Prince William County government alone, $90 million. This has to stop. This is why there's so much inflation. They have pushed so much money out into the economy. That, that's, that's why we're seeing the rise in so much of the products that we're buying. Now, gas is a different discussion. We'll talk about that later, I'm sure. That, but Biden and the Democrats own all of this. We have, to, we have to get this reckless spending in control. What that is gonna require some tough votes. I've taken tough votes and I'm more than willing to, as a member of Congress, rein in the spending. The, the COVID-19, when, when we as a county are looking at using some of this ARPA money for land acquisition or capital projects, <clears throat> courtroom improvements, that has nothing to do with COVID-19. And, and Luke, my son here, is 18, and now he's got, you know, debt strapped around his, his neck and his kids and his kids' kids. That is not fair to the American public. We absolutely have to get reckless spending under control. And Larry, you know, the uh, Congress continues to pile on here. In the last omnibus bill, they reinstituted earmarks which otherwise affectionately known as pork. 4,000 earmarks, $8 billion. Is Congress feasting on pork once again? It's irresponsible, fiscally irresponsible. It's more reckless spending. And then Biden wants to pile on with massive tax increases in an effort to try to pay for all this. And even that leaves him trillions of dollars short. He can't tax his way out of this. Taxing is not the solution. And in Congress, we, a Republican Congress, in Congress, we need to fight against his outrageous tax proposals. We need to reinstate the moratorium against these earmarks, stop the feasting on pork, and rein in the reckless spending and really truly bring fiscal discipline to our spending and carefully look at where we're spending our money and why we're spending the money and what is tied into true federal government functions. I think what yep. Mike's saying is less pork, more cow. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 less pork, more Clancy. <laughs> All right, yeah. but um, ladies and gentlemen, I wrote, and, I wrote and balanced the Navy's budget, $140 billion. I know mm. how to go line by line, by line and, and look for exchanges, um, expenditures. Now, you were, you're one of 435 people, right? But I am part of a coalition, SEAL PAC, 42 of us that fought side by side and looked at each other saying, this is not what we fought for. We're going in there as 20% of the Republican voice. Not only that, I'm already working with members of Congress, Ronnie Jackson, Brian Mass, Mike Waltz, as well as members uh, on the Senate, right? Uh, Tom Cotton and, 
and uh, Rick Scott, good friends of mine. So we're working together, and that's how you build coalitions. We, you need to build coalitions going in there. That's what leadership is. It's, again, it's not about grandstanding. It's about working with coalitions. I'm already doing that right now with certain uh, bills that are going through the house. Okay. Larry, the, uh, you know, one of the, the biggest tragedies uh, was March of last year when the American Rescue Plan was passed on a you know, partisan basis. It didn't rescue anybody except maybe liberal interest groups. It flooded the economy with $1.9 trillion when, we are, when our economy was already growing at 6.5%. So that wound up contributing to the inflation that, that we saw over the uh, past year that the administration still says is transitory. I guess two, three, four years for them may be transitory, but for us it actually hurts middle class families here in our district. We've talked with small business owners who do landscaping. The gas has gone up. Uh, truckers, you know, diesel now has reached its highest, uh, highest cost ever uh, in, in this area. So, but as a member of Congress, there's about $920 billion of that American Rescue Plan Act money that hasn't been, that has been spent. We need to repeal that, take that out of the economy. That's just one thing we can do, taking more money out of the economy to help lower some of those inflationary pressures. Uh, the second thing we can do is make sure that from a congressional perspective, we're providing oversight because a lot of these bills were written with no strings attached. Mm -hmm. So people can do whatever they want. There was $350 billion that went to states to bail out uh, deficits that didn't exist. An additional $200 billion went to schools when they had $50 billion that they haven't spent yet. So there's a lot of money chasing a lot of nothing out there. It's a lot of reckless and, spending. And, a lot of, and, and I agree with, with John on the, uh, the, uh, the future spending needs to be cut immediately. Yeah. My background is in banking. Near and dear to my heart is the economy and finance. One of the key things we need within our education is financial literacy because I truly see that majority of uh, Congress is actually financially illiterate. So when you think about our economy, we have spent ourselves into oblivion. We have. The printing presses are on fire. We are not in an overheated economy. People are talking about, if you guys follow our interest rates, they're talking about raising interest rates. You probably see it in the home loans and, and everything that's happening locally. We are in an underperforming economy because of failed policies. We have spent so much money, our supply chains are disrupted, and our labor participation is also messed up. There's the great resignation, and we can't get the 18 to 26-year-olds to even work. So this, the, our economy, and no one up here, if anyone says there's a silver bullet or a simple one line solution, and I don't think anyone's saying that, we're all, we're all joking. We're all, we're all joking ourselves. The economy is so complex. We need people who understand those complexities and can do them on a level where we're able to figure out how to spend less. The, the United States is the, the biggest business in the world. If we don't grow revenues as well as, as if we don't grow our revenue as, and lower our expenses, we are not gonna put ourselves in a position where not only today we're gonna thrive, but our future generations are gonna be handcuffed for a long time. Brandon, are you gonna raise taxes? We grow revenues, are you gonna raise taxes? You, you can, I'm not talking about raising taxes. Okay. If you grow the economy, if you grow the economy and you bring more revenue in through growth of the economy, through, through growth, your business, right. Cisco, yeah. if Cisco brings in an extra $200 yeah. billion of revenue, they're gonna pay taxes on that, aren't they? Right, that's what so I want to, I, like, I just economy. wanted to clarify. I taxes. Right, I wanted to clarify that you were talking about growing, growing, growing the economy. business and growing the economy Correct. and growing the, the production and not taxes, right? Let, let me follow up here, and, and Brandon, since you went last in that round, you can go ahead and start here. Um, it was mentioned that there were no strings attached to this money. It was just like, mm. give the states money, give the states money, give the states money. And that's, I think we all agree, is what's contributed to this inflation and the stagnation we've got right now. Um, specifically to the education funding. Uh, the schools were given money because ostensibly we were told they were going to revamp the, their ventilation systems and get, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know, all this equipment so that they could open schools. And of course, they kept the schools closed, as we well know. We're now learning through many reports that much of that money went to inclusivity training and equity. CRT training yep. and equity yep. training for the teachers and for programs that got put into the school outside of the confines of school boards. I know I'm sort of throwing a soft one across the plate here. <laughs> what can you do as a congressman to address this issue? Not just going forward, but what happened here? And, and figure out what happened and, and name names. Go ahead. Well, again, I, I, I think we need an immediate investigation into these special interest groups, these unions, for, their, for what they're trying to push on our children. Now, if you want to talk about, if you want to talk about the, um, 
sorry, I spaced for a second. If you want to talk about where where we are spending money within schools and where the the stimulus money is pushed down. This is specific to the the COVID stimulus money that was sold to the American people. That we got to give the schools all this money so that the schools can get open and the kids can get off the laptops from the kitchen table. And now we're learning where they actually spent. Right. Money. Well, in Loudoun County, they spent it on hundreds of thousands of dollars on private security. They spent fifty, seventy, hundred thousand dollars on plexiglass that we threw away immediately. It's wasteful spending. We need to find ways to cut the wasteful spending. There is no free rides. We, we, our children are educated with, it, with financial literacy. How are we gonna pay off student loans? Do you want all, I want all the student loans I paid off back. I want all that money back. We need financial literacy. In Congress, regardless of what you're talking about spending wise today, most of the members, in my opinion, are not financially literate. We must understand what we are doing with the greatest economy and the amount of money that's coming in, you must know how to manage it to make this world or make this uh, country thrive. So Congress has the power of the purse. The best way that you can affect change on all these localities is defunding, threatening to defund. If they, just like remember President Bush, or I'm sorry, President Trump was going to defund localities that or declared sanctuary cities, sanctuary counties. Yeah, that's exactly what you do with this as well. You, you go after them where it hurts them the most, and that is always the almighty dollar. That is exactly what I will do as your member of Congress. Yeah, especially on the education side, I think uh, you know, it's, it's time to get rid of the you know, Department of Education. They've, mm -hmm. they've outlived their, uh, they've outlived their usefulness. And if you look at the history of the Department of Education, it was actually a Jimmy Carter giveaway to the teachers' union back then, National Education Association. Uh, you know, Reagan, Reagan, and uh, you know, probably should have killed it, but I think. Can, you know, can I follow up? Because I've been hearing yeah. presidents and politicians say that for pretty much 30, 40 years now. Not going to happen. So well, let's face it: if Republicans take the majority, they'll do it partly because they won right here. You're going to be a very valuable Republican in the House, even as a right. freshman. So how do you address this with leadership and say, listen, I ran and won on the idea that we got to get rid of the Department of Education. How will you do that? What will you do? Well, I, th I think you have to build a coalition. Mm -hmm. you, you've you've got to find like-minded people on both sides of the aisle who understand that the American people, dare I say it, American people are pissed. Parents are pissed and downright uh, you know, disgusted at what schools have done. And you see what you know, Department of Education is doing. That, that's how Biden's changing you know, you know, some of the Title IX. It's through the Department of Education and using that as a bludgeon hammer. They're getting $6 billion extra in the Biden budget, so $88 billion. That money is going to be better spent if it's sit down to the states. But you've got to build that coalition. You have to take what we have here, uh, groups like Army of Parents and parents groups, loud, loud moms all across the country, and you need to make sure that their voices are heard because we need action, we need action now because our kids demand it. Yeah, Larry, these, these, issues, these issues cross party lines. There was some recent polling that showed that 60% of parents with children of the age of 18 are gonna vote Republican because they know that Republicans are the party of families, parents, and children, right? And so an example of that is that there's a Parents' Bill of Rights Act pending in Congress right now how many Democrats do you think are co-sponsoring that bill? Zero. Absolutely none. There are 109 Republican co-sponsors. Not one single Republican is co-sponsoring that. I mean, sorry, Democrat is co-sponsoring that bill. That has to change. When I'm in Congress, I will co-sponsor that bill. I'll vote for that bill. We'll put it on Joe Biden's desk because parents have, and for 100 years, the Supreme Court has ruled over and over again that parents have the fundamental right to make decisions on the care and education of their children. The Democrats don't get that. Republicans do. We're the party of families, and that's why we'll be successful in Congress. All right. As a former military person, I believe in the chain of command. You don't go from state to school. It goes from state, uh, I'm sorry, from federal government to state, state to the county, and then the county to school. That's how you keep people accountable. And the, so, this, this whole you know, direct line of accounting doesn't work for me. And we can kill you know, the Department of Energy by, by death by a thousand cuts, right? Just small cuts here and there, and all next thing next, you know, they're sitting in the basement with a red stapler, right? You got, you got, to, you got to do that kind of, you know, you've got to be able to, to, to cut it slowly and uh, 
methodically. The other thing is they've overplayed their hands. Most of the immigrants that came to this country came from many things. Education, freedom, right, family values, and the Democrats really overplayed their hands. They, they destroyed it. And so as a person that's gone around and spoken to different voters, again, there's 45% minorities in this district. And, and what they've told me is like, this is not what we came here for. They're turning this country into what we ran away from. And there's also another thing that I have is being Vietnamese, there's two million Vietnamese in this country. And they, they live in huge conglomerates like in uh, Orange County, California, San Jose, California, Dallas, Texas, Houston, Texas. And so in those large areas where, where they, they have such a big voice, and I am their voice, guess who can bridge that gap between that Democrat uh, um, congressman and us to bring them on our side to our vote? And that's the tactical game that we have to play. We have to hit these little nuances and, and bring them into our fold, and, and that's how we're going to override a veto. And, and Larry, I just want to mention, yeah. because of the comment on defunding or eradicating the Department of Education, I truly think, that, I mean, look, Reagan couldn't do it. It's more powerful than it was before. It would take an act of God. I mean, you need the House, you need the Senate, you need the President, you got to get through a filibuster, and then you're going to have so many special interest groups that are going to come in and, and try to stop it from happening. I have two rank members of education and labor who have endorsed me, Dr. Virginia Fox and Burgess Owens, because of I want to fix our public education system. I am all for school choice, private school, public school, charter schools, et cetera, but the majority of the United States is going to be within the public school system. And how are we going to do that? We are going to focus on literacy, financial literacy, trade programs. There's been a demonization of the blue collar, collar workforce. We need our kids coming out of school, not necessarily having to go to you know, college or university to get a good job. And we need more incubator schools or advanced degree schools where people can come out of high school, get hired by Google, Amazon, or a venture capital company, and bring technology four years forward. We are not going to be able to eradicate the Department of Education. It's a pipe dream. Let's fix what's broken and do it with smart thinking. Let so me tell you how we're going to do it real quick, Larry. Here we go. Let me just one thing. So, so Larry, Larry, I think we have a little different philosophical difference here. I think. I think the education should be at the local level, right? It should be at the local level. Yep. That's, why, that's why Governor Youngkin won, and that's what he's done. He issued executive order number one to deal with the CRT. They passed the, they passed the, the legislation to eradicate the mask mandate by the school boards. They, in April, he signed a bill, the literacy bill, to, to rejuvenate the focus on literacy for the kids, especially first grade through third grade, because they've fallen so far behind. So the Governor Yunkin has addressed literacy, right? So it's a local issue, and now we have the Attorney General investigating the Loudoun County School Board. So I think the power should be at the local level, and I don't disagree, it's hard to move, to turn an aircraft carrier on a dime, it's gonna be hard to eradicate the Department of Education on a dime, but we can certainly roll back its influence, get them out of the curriculum business, let the states run their local, run their local schools just like Governor Yunkin has done. He's been highly successful. I was talking to Elizabeth Schultz down at the March for Life. They are doing so many great things on education. They are turning this thing around. They can't do it on a dime either, but they're making tremendous progress, focusing on computer science, focusing on the trade programs, and focusing on literacy. That's where education belongs in the hands of the local community. Can I, can I just say, too, it's not going to take an act of God to get rid of the Department of Education. It's going to take Congress a majority with a backbone. That's what we need, a majority with a backbone. And so as far as the federal funding for education, the overwhelming majority of federal funding to schools is for the school lunch program mm -hmm. or for special education. Your schools are actually funded through your local and your state dollars. So where are you going to so, fill, where so, are you fill the stop gap? Excuse me, let me finish. So what we need is to get rid of the Department of Education because we do not need the NEA, the National Education Association, which, by the way, happens to be a branch of the Communist Party, or bureaucrats in Washington telling our, our parents and teachers what's best for the schools. We absolutely need to get rid of the Department of Education, and you can figure out ways, the federal dollars that are funding, helping fund the school system, you can figure out a way to channel that down to the states. But I wholeheartedly agree with some of my colleagues up here on stage 
that we need to get rid of the Department of Education. It should never be at the national level, and it doesn't take an act of Congress. It takes members of Congress with a backbone. All right, Ms. Yeah, Henley has been waiting to yeah, get in here. Yeah, just 30 seconds. Uh, the way you do it, you stop doing these things called omnibus, mm -hmm. where the government shuts down. You take the 12 appropriations bill, one bill, one vote, you pass it. That Department of Education bill comes up, yeah, I'm not gonna support that right now. Mm -hmm. And you're gonna get your colleagues around, unless you're gonna make some direct, dedicated changes that bypasses the bureaucracy and does not allow some bureaucrat to change rules on gender or sex, this, that, and the other, so that our, our schools are protected and, and they have the funding they need to actually educate, not indoctrinate our kids. But, so, but, under the, but under that proposal, your local taxes are all gonna go up. Because where's the money gonna come from? If, if the federal funding stops, your local taxes go up. So you're gonna to continue to raise taxes like what's happening in Prince William County? Uh, excuse me, but are you talking about the school lunch program? If you recall, I just said that the overwhelming majority of money, federal money that goes into local school systems. So where's the is money gonna come from if program. the Department like of said, Education doesn't Like fund. I said, it could be worked out where that funding is funneled to the states, but you don't need a Department of Education to, to figure out how to fund hot school lunch programs. You can, you can take that money and funnel it to the states. You do not okay. need a bunch of bureaucrats. You could do block grants. Well, right. And again, the purpose tonight is to figure out the differences and distinctions between the candidates, since they don't agree on so much. This has been very healthy to do that. Don't, don't flip the slide real fast, because I'm, I'm sensing a moment where I can go rogue. Um, <laughs> Again? <laughs> because, because I love the specter, uh, John, of you standing up and telling Kevin McCarthy, parents are pissed, I like that. Mm -hmm. I wanna see that in the first caucus of the Republicans in the new Congress. And the idea of getting rid of the omnibus bills. Mm -hmm. uh, John Boehner promised us that in 2010, never happened. Never happened. So I, I'm gonna put you on the spot real fast. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, and, and we'll go down the line this way for the first question, and then the second question will come down this way. Uh, and this is, it'll be really fast. You have three answers that you can give. One of three, please. Uh, yes, I will vote for Kevin McCarthy as speaker. No, I will not vote for Kevin McCarthy as speaker. Or I will wait and I choose not to commit at this time. Go ahead. Well, we, we gotta wait because he's done a lot of things. Look, in, in the first 90 days, I raised $450,000. That's hard. He's gone around and raised a lot of money for, for the Republican Party. $200 million so far and President Trump like it wholeheartedly endorsed that and so we've got to wait and see what happens okay if he runs yeah i'm a, i think we have to wait and see what the congress looks like when Should when we get on the wait and see yeah. option damn it yeah. the fatal flaw yeah. i'm kidding i'm sorry right because i i do believe i think we we need we we need bold leadership in congress from the republican party and that's We've talked about that tonight. I think you've heard that message coming. Bold, courageous leadership. We, can, we need to change the dynamics in this country and change the dynamics in Congress. Bold leadership, that's what I'm gonna be looking for. Okay. I don't hire an employee until I interview him. So I wanna interview him and see where he stands. Does he stand with the fundraisers or does he stand with the people? Mm. Kevin McCarthy who? I haven't talked to him about this. And uh, I, I'm proud to be endorsed by Ken Cuccinelli, our former attorney general. And if you know, thank you. If you know anything about Ken, establishment does not like Ken. So I haven't even thought about this. Uh, so wait and see, I okay. guess, is my final answer. Um, I don't have any political baggage, any policy baggage. I'm not, in, I'm not indebted to anybody. What I'm going to go there and do is work with my colleagues for the 10th, for the Commonwealth and the nation. That's what I'm going to go do. All right. Um, and my other rogue question actually fits better at the end of our next topic, but thank you for letting me go rogue a little bit there. <laughs> and let's face it, we know who Jennifer Wexton is going to vote for for speaker. So. <laughs> All right, moving on to energy and infrastructure. There's a mention of gas uh, and gas usage and gas policy in the last answer round, so let's get right to it. Compare and contrast the various energy sources and their respective distribution channels in this country and what energy policy you support right now to meet this country's needs right now and moving on to the future. And I think, Brandon, it's your turn to start. So we must be, first and foremost, we must be energy independent. I think we are enslaving ourselves to other countries by not being energy independent. We have 35 billion, 35 billion identified barrels of oil in the United States. 
So we have the ability to drill. Fracking technology has allowed us to access a lot of that. If we do not access that, we will continue to be slaves to other countries. For, secondly, we must, and I said this earlier, we must be natural resource and energy independent. President Biden said we're going to snap our fingers and all of us are going to have electric vehicles. Where is all of the, where are all the minerals going to come from internationally? If we do not access what we've been blessed by our Lord and Savior to have, be in a country with natural resources and minerals plentiful, then we are going to continue to be slaves to the other world powers and we will lose our position on the world stage. End of discussion. We must become energy independent, tap into the oil and get lower the cost while we develop new technologies. Yeah, this is a national security. Is this a, oh, going down the order? Oh, go down the line. Oh, down the line. A, okay. No, we're not going down the line. Uh, this is just a, a mix of. Oh, so I was just going to say this you is. You said earlier that we were going to go this way and then come back. That's now. a I know, question. That was my second oh, going rogue okay. question, okay. which okay. is saving. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm very. Confused. This is the longest I've ever spoken without going to the Hadid carpet cleaning traffic. <laughs> 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 Great, by the way. Terrible. So, Sorry, go ahead. No, that's great. A little, a little levity is great. Uh, so, yeah, the energy independence is a, it's, it's a national security issue. And when, as soon as Biden got in office and started issuing those executive orders on the Keystone Pipeline and shutting down and curtailing our oil production in this country, he put us in a national security risk because we're now trading oil from Russia. And when we, which compromised our ability to deal with Ukraine, which then sent us to Venezuela and to Iran, you just can't make this up how absurd a policy these are. And this is where I think the Republic, uh, you get to Congress, we get a Republican Congress being bold and courageous, exercise that legislative power and reverse his executive orders that have put us in this place and energize, unleash our domestic energy. It'll be great for our economy, obviously. It's critical to our national security. It is the way forward for this country, and it has to be fossil fuels for right now because we don't have the technology to, to fully replace and energize this country, empower this country with other sources. It's got to be gradual, and we have to rely on innovation and technology to get us there, but for right now, we do need the fossil fuels to power this country and to keep our position as a, as a, as a global superpower. Look, the nuclear power, we've been using in the Navy for 75 years, and maybe one day some young officer that's a former uh, nuclear power officer will, will leave the Navy and she'll, she'll uh, run away. Don't pander to me, Cal. <laughs> <laughs> no, his, uh, his daughter just got selected for the uh, nuclear uh, power program. So. There's, there's, many, there's many advantages to nuclear power besides you know, unlimited energy, but also it takes a lot of water to, to cool uh, the, the, uh, the rods. And so what we do is we have a four-stage uh, flash-type distiller, which basically evaporates the water. You collect it, push out the brine. You do it four stages. The water comes out of there as pH 7, pure water. I mean, it, and imagine places like California with unlimited water sources. You wouldn't have a drought. And then, I mean, that, you know, that, just that one act of going to nuclear power or alternative energy, which is not very you know, sustainable. But you know, th those are the things that we need to, to look for. The alternative sources besides coal, but we still need to use coal and, 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 and fossil fuels. That's just the way it is. We haven't decreased our use for that yet. Yeah, Larry, uh, if you look at kind of our energy infrastructure, 20% of our economy runs on renewables. That's wind, that's hydro, that's solar, that's nuclear. 80% is fossil fuels. So the engine that's going to continue to drive the American economy are going to be fossil fuels. Now, what Biden wound up doing, not only canceling the Keystone Pipeline, but he also uh, you know, rejoined the, the Paris Climate Accords. Mm. And that, you know, he pretty much, when he was running, said, hey, I'm going to choke off uh, the, the American fossil fuel industry. And you know, that's probably the only promise that, that, that he made that he's <clears throat> kept thus far at, at the expense of the American uh, taxpayer. One thing as a member of Congress that I would do uh, is, is, is kind of what, what, what President Trump did. There, there's this act called the National Environmental Policy Act. And it sets down rules of how long, uh, uh, how long you get to you know, look at a, a legal review. It gives you two hours or, or two years to do a legal review. So the Keystone Pipeline, uh, 2008 is when they started that process. The House Republicans did vote to have Keystone during the Obama administration. Obama uh, wound up vetoing it. 
Trump comes in, says, hey, we're going to do the Keystone, changes the rule within that act, and unleashed American independ energy independence. Biden closed that rule. As a member of Congress, we need to make sure the President of the United States does not have that power again, because through the administrative state, that is not the rule of law. This is Congress has to exercise its legislative power to the Constitution, and that's what we have to restore. The Republicans have to take power and restore their authority under the Constitution to legislate. And back to the people. Yeah. Woo! Ms. Lawson, do you want to jump in on this? Yeah, am I good? I got Hadid in my head. Uh, sorry, I know, it's catchy. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was, I was happy to sign the Energy Independence Pledge a couple months ago. I wholeheartedly believe that we have to, once and for all, become energy independent because, as we know, it also has effects on foreign policy. So I agree with my colleagues. Keystone Pipeline is a great example. But we also need to make sure that we are drilling on federal-owned land. Uh, that is a policy that I would fully support President Biden, you know, not just uh, shut off the Keystone Pipeline, but, but forbid the permits on federal land. And we absolutely need to change that, as well as offshore drilling. We've got to use the resources that God gave us here on American soil. They're there for a reason. We absolutely can refine in a cleaner way than nations around this world. So absolutely, I, I say drill, baby, drill. I'm all about that. So Larry, Larry you talked about, to segue back to China too, John mentioned the, the Paris Climate Accords. Where's China on that? They're not joining that accord. And they're building coal fire plants right and left. They're powering their country. So once again, Biden has hurt us on a national security perspective. And he's disadvantaging us against China, who is our major global competitor. Yeah, on the, uh, you know, the drilling on federal lands, that's actually already in law. Biden is actually ignoring the law mm -hmm. by, through the administrative straight, uh, state making these rules that extend everything out. We have 55 nuclear power plants. It takes 15 years right now to go from permit to construction. 55, and most of those are here on the East Coast. So, how, so getting rid of some of, the, some of that regulation, unleashing American independence, and guess what? Here, here, here's where the Democrats miss. If we can be energy independent, and these liberals want this green economy, and, and, and some of us want some of this green economy, we'd be able to transition within the resources that we already have and not be dependent. But we're gonna, like Brandon said earlier, we're gonna have to rebuild our supply chain though to, for minerals because 85% of those minerals that we need to do all this electric uh, you know, transformation come from China, yeah. another national security risk. We need to take that money, invest in those supply chains and onshore, uh, onshore those minerals so we can be energy independent. So I feel like this is an opportunity to, to drill down, if I may. Drill, baby, <laughs> drill. Baby, drill. In, ter in terms of what you'll actually face if you go to Congress, because I, I, I love all the things you're saying. Keystone Pipeline, drilling on federal lands, fracking, drill baby drill, uh, uh, nuclear power. Biden hates all that stuff. And, and so now, let's say we get into the majority, let's say you put that into using your legislative powers as a mm -hmm. co-equal branch of government, right. and then the executive vetoes it. And now what do we have? We have a government shutdown. So how important are these issues to you? Because this is where the rubber meets the road. And now, and now you know what happens to sitting members of Congress when the pressure is put on. So uh, why don't we, sure, since you finished, we can start. Thanks, off. so before we talk about Joe Biden, let's all remember the focus is really Jennifer Wexton. We first we got to unseat her. <laughs> and two campaigns she has ran on the Green New Deal. Now she's doing her best to move to the center and retweeting Governor Yunkin's plan to the a moratorium on the gas taxes. Yeah, that's how con concerned she is for this seat. But let's not forget, Jennifer Wexton is, just as much as Joe Biden, all in on this Green New Deal, energy, uh, renewable energy resources that, by the way, we know are going to hike our utility bills more than they already have. A lot of inefficiencies with these grand ideas that the left comes up with. So let's remember that we got to unseat Miss Green New Deal first here in the tent. Um, and then, what, oh, as far as the pressure goes, uh, I am happy to take tough calls. I will absolutely, I, first of all, I signed last week a term limits pledge. I am more than happy to go to Congress 
fulfill three terms if the voters will have me in the 10th district, and then say, you know what, it's time for somebody else to represent this district. We have, we have too many politicians on both sides of the aisle that go to Congress and plan to make lifetime careers out of it. You will not get that from me, folks. I, uh, I just want to say, I also, Come on in. I, also, I, also say, I also signed that same pledge. I have no aspirations to be a career politician. I have never thought I would be doing this in the first place. But with regards to the energy and what we need to do and how we need to hold fast against this administration, look at what they did with the strategic oil reserves. A million barrels a day. Think about it. We have to replace those same oil reserves at a higher price. Mm. This administration has a failed energy policy. We must fight them and continue to put more money in your pockets. Every day I fill up my 1999 Suburban, if it's $170. All of you are feeling the same pain. We need people who are gonna stand up, fight against their agenda, fight against their energy policies, and put more money back in your pockets. Yeah. yeah. Anybody else want to speak to? I, did, I, again. I just think it's an issue, though, that, Larry, that does cross party lines. I think we'll get moderate Democrats to join us on this because their constituents are paying these high gas prices and their constituents are being hurt by the inflation and by, the, by, by higher food prices and higher the supply chain impacts. Yeah. And in terms of the uh, point about the, uh, the, the making politicians, the career politicians, I likewise have signed that pledge for, for term limits. I think one of the things that is dysfunctional about Congress is when they stay for 20 or 30 years, they make it a career. I'm not the career politician. I'm a fresh and independent voice, and I'll be that for you in the United States Congress. Yeah, I don't even know why they get retirement. How, at what point, where do you go to work for five years and you get retirement? I mean, we need to stop that. But honestly, for, for like a lot of these uh, energy issues, it's the regulations that kill us, right? You know, like the BP oil spill. They're very, everybody's very worried about that in the Gulf of Mexico. The problem is, it's so because of the regulations, they have to go so far out. It's so deep. You need saturation divers to go down and plug up uh, the the spill when it happens. It needs to be in an area where we can actually cap and and uh, control it in case of some of spill. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. John. Larry, you mentioned about you know government shutdown. If we stop doing these omnibus appropriations bills and we get back to normal order, then we can shut down the right things like the Department of Education and hold their funding until we come to an agreement on something. But we can make sure defense is gone, Social Security, Medicaid, uh, uh, you know, uh, other, uh, you know, FBI, uh, you know, DHS. I forgot that you, that was your original question was the um, yeah. government shutdown. Yeah. And honestly, but that's how you do it. Yeah. One, one vote, one appropriation, get it passed, and you hold the ones up that you have questions on. Okay. Look, government sure. shutdown is just a free vacation for a lot of government. Yeah. They're, they're going to get the money back anyways. Uh, let's hold, hold off on switching the slide here. I know that there's a bustle out there because you're getting cards. I want to explain what's happening. At this time, our I'm going to read this now. At this time, our volunteers will be passing out comment cards, candidate <laughs> poll cards, and pens <laughs> to fill out these cards. Please share the pens with your neighbors. Don't fight over the pens. It's just a freaking pen. <laughs> do, we, do we get one? We would appreciate it if you could please fill out both cards and drop them in one of the baskets on the check-in tables as you leave. The candidate poll cards, I just did that impromptu. I didn't, that wasn't written down. I just thought it was good. The candidate poll cards will be compiled and the results will be posted on our website by Friday. Thank you. All right. I'm sorry. Oh, and the website, that wasn't written down, Alicia. The website is armyofparents.org. Woohoo! All right. Um, also, I'm going to go rogue on this, too. Um, my other rogue question coming down this way. Um, as a freshman in Congress, you'll have the opportunity to serve on one or two committees. Can you name the number one committee that you want to be on? Starting with you, Brandon. I actually want to be, and my background is banking, so you would think it'd probably be appropriations or something with banking. I actually want to be on education and labor. I have four children under 10 years old. I want to see the education of my children and all of your children and the children across the United States get better. And I think we need strong leaders to do that. And that would be the number one if I had one pick. Ms. Lawson. Appropriations. House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. That way, when Adam Schiff tries to follow me, I'm like, no, no, I voted to kick you out of committee. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, Larry, as the, as the lawyer in this race, I would want to be on the Judiciary Committee because I think it's absolutely essential we protect the Supreme Court. 
as a veteran, I mean, I'd love to be on the Veterans Committee because to take care of our wounded warriors. Uh, I mean, I'm 100% I'm disabled, so I mean, I need to take care of my own too. All right, thank you for that. Moving on to our next question, it does involve education funding that we've touched on quite a bit here. It has to do with the federal government and your role as a member of the House of Representatives. Education, we all agree, should remain a local issue, but the federal government's taken advantage of the ESSER, the CARES, and the ARP funding to influence schools' decisions that have not been in the best interest of students. So what legislation would you put forward that will provide schools with the money while guarding against schools choosing to accept federal grant money over the best interest of students, parents, and teachers. I know that we've already touched on this a bit in our other answers, so uh, don't feel the need to extrapolate because I can come up with some other questions as well. But I think we've already been through the line once this way, so we'll start again with Mr. I mean, Cowan. It's, look, it's, it's got to go from the federal government to the state, the state to the county, and, and, and the county to schools. That's the only way we can hold people accountable. The federal government can't keep each school accountable for what they do with the money, and that's it's... It's wrong for us to, to go direct, direct funding from the federal government to the schools. So it, just to follow up so I can clarify the question, because we are talking about money that the federal government gives to the school systems, um, and then they attach all these strings and provisions to it. It's like, well, you don't get your federal money unless you, you know, change preferred pronouns or what have you. Yep. So is there any role for the House of Representatives in their oversight capacity to, to do something about how the, uh, the funds are being tied to policy? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just just like with any kind of pork or any um, any other issues like that, we we've got to stop the uh, any language that that ties certain critical race theory or or you know gender pronoun. We got to cut cut all that that language out of there. Yeah. So the Department of Education is doing this through their administrative process, right? And they're tying the tying these dollars up and, and implementing their their indoctrination and their various social agendas and political agendas. And so Congress, again, has to define how this money, first of all, I would get the, the, back to my original philosophical point is get the Department of Education out of all of that decision making and leave it with the states where it properly belongs and where people like Governor Yunkin are executing. But to the extent that we're, the, but con in terms of this specific question, Congress needs to take control of what, how that money is used and, and legislate against those types of provisions being attached to the dollars. I think you have to make sure whatever strings are attached that the local community has input. So that's why they call it representative government. So being out in the community, finding out what are the school's needs, and then bringing those to Washington, and then you, you develop legislative remedies around that. That's, that's the basic role of a member of Congress. That's the only way you're going to get actually targeted money to what needs to be spent, whether it be you know, do we need new buses? Uh, you know, do we need, you know, broadband in areas? I know Rappahannock needs broadband. Uh, you know, uh, are there curriculum choices that, that, that we can't afford right now in, in some of the, the uh, you know, more uh, or less affluent uh, areas? But as a representative, represent, bring those issues to the federal government and work together and get those solved. Yeah, so we already touched on this a lot, power of the purse. Uh, it, I would also say as a member of Congress when it comes to education, I would wholeheartedly support a, a parents' rights bill at the, at the national level. So you know, we touched on this, a lot of us touched on this. It is a, you know, yes, there's a lot of state decisions that go into our schools, but let's be a little transparent here. We live in the wealthiest county or the wealthiest district in the United States. Yep. As a, as a representative for this country, not everyone's blessed to be in that position. So I think we need to make sure the programs that we are putting forward are encouraging the youth of today to be educated, to be beneficial parts of our economy and our, in our communities for tomorrow. And that is the education on literacy, financial literacy, trade programs, and incubator schools. And if we tie it to those, states will adopt it and it will make our children be better to be able to take care of us for the future and be you know, I have someone who's going to, you know, be creative for the economy. So let's follow up on this in a, in a different approach here, because a lot of those strings that we're talking about that were attached, the actual strings were supplied not by voters, not by citizens, not by congressmen or senators, Lobbies. but by very powerful lobbyists, Lobbies. mostly when it regard to education, yep. uh, powerful employee unions, mm -hmm. government employee unions that, that ostensibly say that they represent the teachers and educators. Uh, Talk to me about how, what you believe the role, the proper role of these government employee unions are, 
and what you would do in your capacity as a congressperson with regard to how, on a national level, these unions affect federal policy. Is there even a role? Do you agree with Franklin Roosevelt that our government employees should not be unionized? Uh, go ahead and open it up. Can I jump into this? Uh, I didn't think I'd ever say that I agree with the FDR on something, but here I go. I do, because... Right now in Prince William County, we are facing collective bargaining, public sector collective bargaining. Yep. So the Democrats, when they, when they took control of the General Assembly after the 2019 elections, in 2020 they passed a very ambiguous bill that allows for public sector bargaining at the localities. They left it ambiguous knowing how reckless it would be. I now have uh, the Prince William County employees that are petitioning our board, and I can't imagine a police department, and it's probably gonna pass because I'm in the minority, I cannot imagine a police department where my chief of police no longer has the discipline authority over the officers or it, you name it, any agency in Prince William County. And now we have to um, hire a whole new team of county attorneys to start negotiating with a bunch of union goons. So absolutely, we, we should not, like FDR said, should not have public sector collective bargaining ever. Yeah. So it's, Larry, when you're, I, you're, you're basically bargaining against yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Larry, when I, when I read the Constitution, I can't find the section that talks about the administrative state or federal employee unions running our country. And that is where we've gone over the last 20 or 30 years. And again, we get to Congress, we gotta reassert control and roll back the administrative state and Congress has to take control. It delegates too much authority to the executive. It writes statutes that are too vague and too problematic. And we need people who understand the law, know how to write legislation, can write it specifically. And I will bring that skill set to Congress as the attorney in this race who's handled on federal legislation, who understands the Constitution and understands its principles and its precedent because there is no such thing as an administrative state in the United States Constitution and there's no place for these federal unions to be running our country. Yeah, I don't, oh, he, go, he ahead. Ran go ahead. Oh, okay, okay. go ahead. I'll go after. <laughs> yeah, there's no, there's no role for, for unions. And I think we see, you know, special interest groups. Let, let's just, let's bring it down to the Loudoun County level. You had the National School Board Association work with the Department of Education secretary to drum up a false flag operation via a letter work with the White House, send that over to DOJ. DOJ sends over the FBI. FBI opens up a special office to target you and me because we're speaking up at, at school board meetings. We're speaking out against sexual assault. We're speaking out against CRT. There should be no role for, for these unions in federal decisions or these associations, which is why we need to have transparency and we need to have accountability those two things do not, are, are, they're not realistic today. So we need to elect leaders who'll go in and bulldoze it down. Call a spade a spade. I'm not fundraising. I'm out knocking on doors. I'm not gonna fundraise when I get to Congress. I'm gonna knock on doors. I'm gonna talk to people. I'm, I'm not going up there to make friends. I'm going up there to make a difference. That's, that's, that's my plea. So um, I actually last Monday, and I didn't make any friends by saying this when I was on Fox. I said, I will launch an investigation into the special interest in teachers' unions for what they have done to our children, the DOJ and this administration. These unions were set up a long time ago to protect the workers. Now, what they're trying to do is push agendas. Over the last two years, and this is what gets me very passionate, and some of you have seen the stuff when I am, over the last two years, all of these union officials have used our children as shields. Mm -hmm. That must stop. These unions have become so powerful that they influence people. There's a lot of wealthy people out there. They spend a lot of money to have some power. We must stop that power. We must give the power back to the parents when they have a voice. We must give the power to the students so that they have a voice. And we must stop the influence of these unions. All you, need, I don't all, all you need to know is that nearly 100% of the teacher union political donations Go to Democrats. Democrats. One party, yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Hunter. You, look, we do not need 
unions in the federal government. It's not like we're running a sweatshop. When I commanded, one of my commands, I had a union there. <laughs> and the only thing they would gripe about, honestly, it's, it's uh, parking. Right? <laughs> like, so, like, there's parking. They just didn't want to walk their happy butts over there. Uh, but, but, but you understand, like, when, when we have a union in government, as, as big as the union is, you're actually paying someone to sit there to gripe about you. Like, why am I paying for this person to sit there to, to, to gripe about me about, like, parking spots? Or, I mean, it's not, like I said, we're not running a sweatshop here. And why, why is the federal government beholden to a union? All right, and, and, great. And let me, I just want to say, because there was some mention here about the DOJ investigation into people at school board meetings, and to be honest and fair, Ian Pryor does sort of get off the air yeah. the domestic terrorist. I mean, if anyone in this room is a domestic terrorist, he's got that look about him. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ian, you keep doing what you're doing. All right, so to sum up what you were saying here in Talk Radio Talk, and you can steal this if you want, not only are you going to send Jennifer Wexton into retirement, but you're going to send Randy Weingarten there, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would do it. All right. Um, you may have noticed today in the news that there was some stuff happening in D.C. today. Life wins! <laughs> Life wins. Uh, it appears, uh. if we're to believe the media, it's a crapshoot, um, <laughs> that the Supreme Court's on the verge of striking down the Roe v. Wade decision of 1972. Uh, now, of course, we all know that that doesn't mean it's going to outlaw abortion. Mm -hmm. What it immediately does, effectively, is make this a state's issue, and each state has their own laws and regulations with regard to it already in place. However, there is already a move to federalize this issue, not through the Supreme Court, but through the legislation. So I think it's important, given the day's events, that you all speak your mind and address this issue specifically about the role of the federal government, whether there should be a federal law, whether we should have, as some say, a patchwork of laws, uh, state by state. Where do you stand on this issue? Um, let's add, leave your next discussion. Okay, sure. Um, well, first, it was reprehensible that that draft decision was released publicly. It was done, you have to, we don't know for sure, but all indications are it was done to intimidate the Supreme Court. The Democrats have done this over and over again. They keep escalating a brazen attack on the Supreme Court, trying to intimidate the court and really undermine our constitutional structure of having separation of powers. To the ultimate question, no, there is no place for federal legislation. If you read the Constitution, that is not one of the powers of the federal government to legislate in this arena. It's a state's rights issue. So even if Schumer somehow pushes through some bill, it's not gonna be upheld by the Supreme Court ultimately because they're gonna kick it back as unconstitutional. It's this grandstanding in an attempt to intimidate the court. It's it, whoever, release that if they're an attorney, they should be debarred for the rest of their lives from their career as a lawyer, and the Department of Justice, or maybe it'll take a Republican uh, Judiciary Committee, which hopefully I'll be serving on, will investigate how this happened, and they should pursue criminal prosecution. It's absolutely outrageous, but no federal law, there's no constitutional basis for it, it goes back to the states. Yep, I agree. Uh, Tenth Amendment is there for a reason. What's, what's, what the federal government doesn't have is reserved to the states. You know, before Roe Ro v. Wade was incorrectly decided back in 1972, you had 30 states that outlawed uh, abortion, didn't allow any uh, exceptions, rape, incest, uh, health of the mother. But you did have 20 states that had, you know, all three of those. So that's the nice thing about having these incubators as states. Let them figure out what the right mix is for them. Because that means your voice matters more because it's closer to the local issue. You're closer to your local representative, your state representative. So it needs to stay at the states. Federal government, I agree with Mike, if, if they try to pass something to try to kill a filibuster or, 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 or before the, uh, mm. the decision comes out, uh, that's something that we have to stand strong against. Inciting an insurrection. Where do we hear that before? <laughs> that's what they're doing. That's yeah. exactly what's happening when they, they, they release the, uh, the memo. And I'm telling you decision. right now that we need, we can do data forensics. You can go in there and find, I mean, I can see what's on your computer, right? I mean, we can, I can find out where you were by just uh, geotagging um, and looking through your Facebook and everything else. We know who, we can find out exactly who released that. And like Mike said, the, disbar them. Even if they're a Supreme Court justice that, that leaked that, I we need to find out who it is. <laughs> <laughs> so I, am, I, I have four wonderful children. They are a blessing to my wife and myself. Um, I care for them deal, dearly. This is, I, drew, I do believe this is a state issue, but what we're seeing from this 
is that the left and the Democrats, in my opinion, will continue to do what they do best, lie, steal, and cheat. Yep. They are trying to bring up a topic that both sides are extremely passionate about. Why? Because they want to deflect from the issues that are at hand. The education of our kids, the safety of our, our nation, and our economy. This is a deflection. This is what they do best. Lie, steal, and cheat. And I love the little babies. I've been blessed with four of them, and I'm definitely uh, supportive of this being a state issue. All right, Janine, we all see what you've done here. Thank you. Uh, I'm actually trying to read the second part of your question, but I can't. Oh, this is a question. I've, I've, go, I've gone rogue again. Oh, okay. Rogue. Traffic on 66 uh. is backed up. At, <laughs> no. So <laughs> that's good, actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, first of all, I want to echo Mike's comments and others about how reprehensible it is. And it's interesting to note that the last time that this happened, and maybe it's the only other time in the history of our Supreme Court, was the Roe v. Wade decision. This is an issue that I think defines, abortion is what defines the left more than anything yep. else. They're obsessed with it. They're rabid about it. If the National Organization of Women really cared about women, they would be front and center with me fighting uh, this transgender nonsense. Mm. So I, I wholeheartedly agree that this is a state's rights um, decision. It should have never been de decided 50 years ago by the United States Supreme Court. I'm thrilled that the draft looks like it's going to be in our favor. We do know that this was going to be uh, a decision handed down by the Supreme Court, whether it's right now or later this summer. So. We knew that this was going to be an issue. I knew this was going to be an issue in this race uh, when I signed up for this last July. This is an issue that we cannot run from. I am unequivocally, unapologetically, a defender of babies in the womb. I, I, thank you. I am more than willing to have this discussion with Ms. Jennifer Wexton. She is the darling of Planned Parenthood, like she is the darling of the LGBTQ movement. We are now not just talking about abortion like in the first trimester. We are facing a dark party that has become godless. And we are facing a party right here in Virginia that defeated on a party line vote Delegate Nick Freitas's bill that would have required medical attention, medical care for a baby that survives an abortion. Born alive. And yep. that's right. They defeated that in the Virginia Senate. I cannot wrap my head nor my heart around that. And I know everybody in this room agrees with me. That's how, that's how dark this party has become. I guarantee you Planned Parenthood is going to throw millions of dollars into this race. I am ready to have that discussion because I believe the overwhelming majority of Virginians in the 10th district agree with me that the left is way too extreme on, on abortion. And we have to make sure that we are promoting life at all stages in the womb and as an adoptive mother, we have to make sure that we are the party that is also pro-adoption. I fully support tax credits for families that want to adopt. It's an incredibly expensive process. I can't imagine, Dan and I cannot imagine our life without Luke. And he's here tonight. And thank you. He's 18 years old. And, and he is the joy of our life just as much as our biological daughter. But I want you to know I am fully committed to having this discussion with Jennifer Wexton if I am your nominee. Yep. Hey, thanks, thanks for sharing that. I mean, you're right. The adoption, adoption process is very expensive. We had to go through it ourselves, and it is very expensive, and, but it's a, such a blessing. But going back to, to our, our laws here in Virginia, this is equal to what happens. The, the abortion laws are the same as in China and North Korea, and it's even worse in, in California. They allow, they call it abortion, 30 days, 30 days after birth. 30 days in California. So this is, we will be judged as a nation and as a people for this. 
Oh, there will be a judgment, if that's for sure. <laughs> uh, Luke, that's so cool. When did you turn 18? Of last oh, wow. year, so he said he's voting for me, too. I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you want to tell us who you're endorsing or who you're going to vote? Thanks, Luke. <laughs> All right. We, are, we have reached our final question. Uh, uh, no, maybe that was it. Are you, are you pulling me off the stage? Yeah, we were going to get to this question. So well, we it appears it that the President of the United States and the Speaker of the House and now our latest Supreme Court Justice are incapable of defining woman. Um, is it time, I don't, this is a very serious thing, because this definition is important with regard to statutes that are on the books. Should the federal government, and would you endorse the idea of the federal government in the next session of Congress actually defining legally what a woman is? And how would you define it? Follow the science, right? XX and XY. <laughs> right. It's really quite serious. If, you, if you're too stupid to know about XX and XY, then if you pee standing up and you're a man, you pee sitting down and you're a woman. How's yeah. that? <laughs> what I say, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, they can, they can do surgical changes there, huh? Yeah. So you got to be careful with the surgery. But just want the record yeah. reflect that I did not get in the gutter with potty. Yeah. <laughs> so you all lost the bet. <laughs> no, I go back to what I said two hours ago. XX, XY, it's a matter of science, it's a matter of biology, and the Democrats just continue to defy science at every level of our, of our society and with their, with their agendas. And you know what? I look at our society, our constitutional rights, our family values, our schools we've talked about tonight. We haven't gotten to college campuses yet, which have become just woke, woke indoctrination to stab universities. And you know, we've got it in our military, we've got it in our workplaces. We've even got American exceptionalism all under a relentless attack by the cancel culture, this radical divisive equity agenda, and identity politics. And that's why we're all up here. We need to fight back, we need to be bold, we need to be courageous. And that's why I'm running for Congress, and I will be your voice, and we will fight hard, and we will get this country back on the right track, because Biden, Wexton, Pelosi are taking us down the wrong road to a cliff with no bridge. Yeah, I think what we're going to have to do from a federal level is we're going to have to do a review of all legislation that just has the word sex. And we're going to have to include the word biological. Uh, you know, here's the thing about Democrats, and Janine said it uh, a while ago, you know, Democrats are godless. Our rights are God-given. Constitution and the founding of this nation, based on faith, based, based in faith in God and the Bible. And Genesis said God made them male, female. So if we allow Democrats to try to rewrite uh, you know, what, what, what God gave us as, as rights, then, then we've failed to live up to the principles that we're called to do, and that's defend freedom, and that's to defend the weak uh, by, by be, becoming strong. So I, we're going to have to look at all the legislation and actually put biological. It's got to be based on science, not feelings. So I continue to talk tonight about my record because my record matters. I have an eight-year voting record. And I have a record on this issue. I voted in June of 2020 against what the state passed, the Democrats, of course, to hand down. And I, on record, on video, said that I reject this adoption into our ordinance because there is only male and female. So I'm already on record, folks. You can count on me at the mm -hmm. congressional level sticking to oh, that. Yeah. There's only two. And as John said, the Lord created two, and there's nothing in between. Oh. Similar to the others, XX and XY, but what scares me the most about what we are getting pushed on this ideology and indoctrination is what's flowing down to our children. Mm -hmm. They are being told that this is normal. The most innocent and easily influenced part of the population. Bruce Jenner, when he was 50 years old, can become Caitlyn, but he was a 50-year-old man who decided to make that decision. My seven-year-old daughter can't vote, can't drink, and can't drive a car. What are we doing telling them that they can change who they are? It's a man and a woman, it's XX and it's XY, end of discussion. Yep. Right. Uh, and, listen. And might, I, and might, I, might I add to Brandon's point, and, and not even tell the parents. Correct. Yeah. Not yeah. even tell the parents. Yeah. The last time I was uh, privileged to be a moderator of a candidate's forum for Republicans, um, Glenn Youngkin emerged that evening and ended up becoming our next <laughs> governor. Now, 
Where, where was he sitting? I, I'm not saying. <laughs> I'm not saying you're looking at your next congressman, Virginia 10, but it's a pretty good shot. I yeah. And it's all because of me. No. <laughs> Listen, the, uh, the idea of representative democracy began here in the Commonwealth of Virginia before right. it was even a commonwealth, before we were a nation when it was just a colony. And it is uh, stirring and powerful to know that we continue this tradition to determine as a group of citizens who our representatives will be at this incredibly critical time. I've been so honored to be able to facilitate this conversation tonight, and I think it's clear that the winners are the voters and residents of Virginia. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please thank the candidates tonight. Good job, Mike. Good job. So, I'm Carol. Good job, man. Good job, man. Good job. Good job. Good job. Uh, if, I believe the candidates are going to want to mix it up with you a bit if they don't, you know, uh, start doing shots and punch each other. Here on Brandon. Uh, Alicia Brand, uh, our, our fantastic hostess tonight, would love to say a few words here and give you your marching orders. Oh, yes, ma'am. First of all, I'd like to thank Larry O'Connor. You are a tremendous host. Oh, my gosh. Thank you. Yes. Truly thank my you. honor. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I'd like to thank this great panel of candidates. Whomever we get, you are all amazing. And I hope that you don't, if you don't make it to the, to, to the general, I hope that you will consider running and representing us in our board of supervisors or in another role because you are all fantastic. Amen. And thank you. I'd also like to thank Sam Matero behind the camera over there. He is recording this for us free of charge. He's Red Sea Media. This guy is tremendous. He's, he's great at production. He used to um, run Nova Now, but he changed the name. It's USA Now, and he is absolutely fabulous, and we thank him so much. And the last bit of information I'd like to request of all of you is to please fill out your cards. We want to do the straw poll, and we also would like to know how we're doing, because we'd like to do many, many events. And on that note, please consider donating to Army of Parents. There's a QR code right up front. And on your water bottles, and all you have to do is scan it with your, with your phone, or go to armyofparents.org and make a generous uh, a donation. We will be so appreciative. Thank you so much for coming out and wave to the protesters on your way out. Uh -huh.